Let me just quickly introduce some of our team members. My name is Sophia Lorem, this is Greg Taylor, this is Chome Gal, and then this is Roman Torres. And we're here to present to you about our company. So you may have heard the term legato, but what you may not know that this is actually a music notation indicating a smooth and, um, and flowing manner of music without breaks between notes. But what you may be unaware is that this term can actually be applied to the financial advisory business. Within the financial advisor industry, there's a plethora of opportunities, and we as students at GW, we're just hoping to capitalize on these opportunities. We, will, we are trying to start a business in which we will be buying up actually books of business from advisors looking to exit the industry, and we're gonna be rolling up these books into our own pers our portfolio. Our goal is to provide a smooth, seamless transition from the advisors leaving to the clients who are willing to stay, and we will be managing their books into our firm, the Legato Investments. You may say, why the advisor industry? Well, if you look at the demand, the advisory, the advisory industry has grown from one trillion to two trillion, which is doubled. And then the accounts within that assets under management have more than doubled. Also on the supply side, there are more financial advisors over the age of 70 than under the age of 30. In addition, 40% of those advisors are, are going to retire in the next 10 years. And then 42% of those do not have a succession plan. Now, what is the advisory industry? What does it look like? So here's the stratification of the advisory industry, where you have from zero to uh, 50 million assets under management is roughly $90 billion. Then you have from $50 million to $200 million, which is roughly $250 billion. And, and holistically, it's $356 billion as an industry combined. We're focused on that red box that you see, from zero to $50 million. And then within the interim, the first 12 months, maybe even 18 months, we're focused on the zero to five million of assets under management. Now, what is a book of business that Sophia has alluded to? A book of business is when a financial advisor has his clients that he manages their money, their funds, and that, 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 that pool of investments is considered his portfolio. That portfolio is a book of business. Now, why would a financial advisor leave the industry? Well, there's various reasons, actually. They get burned out, they're a one-man shop, trying to make it happen on their own, and not be able to you know, have their own revenue for themselves, or they have other opportunities which they can generate a salary for themselves, or they just, they're ready for retirement. So these are some of the various industries that you see behind me. Now, how do these advisors collect their fees? How do they get their revenue uh, and maintain their living? Well, there's two ways. One is commission-based or fixed fee-based. A commission-based business is, or a fee structure, is when the asset manager is basically making transactions within the portfolio, and then as he makes those transactions, he's receiving a commission. Or the insurance company or a um, mutual fund uh, company can offer them a product that they put into their portfolio and they receive a kickback or a commission from that product. And then there's also the fixed fee, which is he has assets under management, he gets a percentage of that, of that uh, assets under management. Now here's a distribution of just the DC metropolitan area where there's around six, we've, we're able to capture some little bit of data on the fees for uh, these assets under management. And what you can see, as you move down the lower scale, the distribution, the smaller the fund, the higher the fees. And this is the market that we're going after. Small funds, high fee, where we're gonna reduce that cost by offering a 1% fee structure. And then um, and the, the lower market ends up paying between two to 3% or more even in some cases. So there's an there's opportunity window there. So why we want to transition? As I mentioned, we are the term legato. We've identified the supply and demand of the market. So now let's take a look at the, what the market actually needs. For financial advisors looking to exit the industry, they want three specific things. They want to ensure that they have a fair price for the book that they're selling. They want to ensure that they have a very low risk exit strategy. And thirdly, they have a reputation risk. If you think about it, many of these advisors have been in the industry for about 20 years now. They have built a reputation. They've built a company based off of their reputation. And we want to ensure that this continues in the long run. Clients in the business, what do they want? First and foremost, they want certainty. They want certainty of their investments. They want certainty that their advisors that's going to be acquiring their books are, going to, are, are trustworthy. And finally, they want minimal disruptions. And we have a plan in which we'll be partnered with these investors to, ensure, uh, to these exiting advisors to ensure that we have a continuous plan. Okay? At Legato Investors, why are we different? First off, we're ensuring transparency by providing from a commission-based structure to a fixed fee structure. Secondly, we're actually gonna be actively partnering with these investment advisors who are looking to exit the industry. 
We're going to do this through a few different ways. We're going to provide them with a feasible exit strategy. This includes having an earnout ratio in which they are incentivized <coughs> to continue to partner with us for the next year or so to ensure that we have a very high retention rate, risk ratio. And then, as I mentioned, retention ratio. We need to ensure that the clients who are in their current book of business want to stay with us. So again, this again works with partnering with the actual investment advisors who are exiting the industry. And finally, we're going to be adding value to the investment management and do, uh, assuming fiduciary responsibilities for the, for the portfolio. Speaking of adding value, a recent Vanguard survey indicated that um, financial advisors can add value for their clients. And that value can come in, in five different components, whereas lower the expense rate, which we're doing from the onset. Portfolio, uh, rebalancing portfolio and asset allocation. We're doing that when, after we purchase the initial book of business or acquiring books of business, we, our validation and implementation strategy is doing those two components. In addition, with, with drawing the right investments at the right time for retirement and behavioral coaching. So it can be 3.75% of additional value that can be added uh, for, for our clients uh, due to this added value perspective. So speaking to our implementation strategy, we have a few different market implementation strategy. First, there's actually, we, we have located a market in which financial advisors looking to exit the industry are able to post their books of businesses for sale. We can use these websites to under, actually understand the underlying assets that are within their portfolio. Second, there are Bloomberg searches in which um, uh, there are certain advisors who are leaving. And we can actually specifically target these investment advisors that, are, that have assets under management between zero to five million dollars. Third strategy is actually we looked into the cost of customer acquisition. To, the cost of a, to acquire a customer from scratch is between $300 to $1,000. By using our strategy of um, buying books of business, you're looking at a cost about $200 to $300 per customer. So this is already lower than the industry standard. So we're going to do this through, through a few different means. We're going to have to perform a very thorough due diligence of the, of the assets under management. We need to understand the legal components, the compliance components, how to translate them from a, um, from a commission-based um, book of business to a fixed fee book of business. And finally, we need to make sure that the underlying securities are aligned to our investment strategies. And then what we're going to do is actually we're going to as soon as we acquire a book of business, we're going to try and understand the specific characteristics that we want to purchase. We're going to use data analytics, actually, to create a systematic approach so that we can efficiently acquire more books of businesses. And then, as you can see, this is our Legato short-term strategy right now. Uh, the Legato portfolio is at the center, and we, are be, we will be acquiring these various books of businesses. We're hoping to grow through acquisition, acquire more books of businesses, we're going to be lowering our expense ratio by adding value to what Greg has talked about earlier. We're going to provide them with a rate of return that Greg will talk about in a little bit. And finally, we're hoping to grow organically. Now, what is that initial investment, or our first, our initial investment request? We're looking for around $30,000. Now, what does that $30,000 entail? $5,000 is startup costs getting the business established. And $25,000 is that compliance and legal cost that we need, which is our fixed cost. And and then from that standpoint, we're also going to generate $15,000 of the founder's money, which is ourselves, to buy or purchase that initial book of business. So it's a total of $45,000, and fifteen dollars comes from us in, in, in the very beginning. Now, in the long term, as we try to reach a kind of scale to re reduce that fixed cost, that compliance cost, we're looking for approximately $600,000, broken down in two ways, which is $500,000 to help us get to a scale, which is roughly $5 million of assets under management, which is 1% of uh, the purchasing uh, price, essentially. And then the working capital of $100,000, which includes that initial $30,000 for that first 12 months, and then another $70,000 of just continuing operations. Now, in buying the book of business, we estimate that each purchase that we, uh, each book of business that we purchase is going to give us a rate of return of roughly between 15 to 28%. Now, industry, has roughly a range of 11 to 47 percent return on equity, and we fall within that range itself. Now, we're giving, we're painting a story of our long-term view, but so our vision is to use data analytics to lower our expense ratio, identify specific books of business till we get to the point where we can say, hey, this book of business is the one that we want to purchase due to different data points that we have that we have analytically analyzed, <clears throat> and then we're going to acquire these books of business, lowering our uh, our fixed costs and uh, retention costs going, going through time to basically 
And also, we're also going to have compliance information that we're going to gain from each acquisition to help us create a compliance platform, which eventually will allow us to go after other registered investment advisors who may be small but do not want to leave the business but would like to reduce their face costs as well. So why are you guys here? Why specifically invest in Legato? We have a few reasons why. First off, the, the, just the general market. Currently, there's more supply than demand in terms of books of businesses. As Greg mentions, there's 40% of investor advisors that will retire in the next 10 years and do, and do not have a succession plan. We're offering them an opportunity to get out and, and invest in people who are much younger than the statistics of um, under 30-year-olds. So second off, um, <clears throat> As we mentioned, we're willing to do the work. Acquiring these books of businesses is not, it's, it's, it may sound pretty easy of just buying the books of business and looking at, taking a look at the underlying assets, but there's a lot of due diligence that needs to be done. There's compliance, understanding the compliance, understanding the legal costs, understanding how do you make a portfolio viable. We're willing to put in the work. We have four very capable individuals with a variety of different backgrounds who are willing to do the work, do the due diligence, and make this uh, a relatively low risk investment. Additionally, we're putting our own capital, so we're putting our money where our mouth is. We're actually going to be acquiring the first book of business, and what we need a little assistance on is actually funding our working capital needs. And finally, as Greg mentioned, this is actually a pretty relatively low risk investment. Yes, it may take a few years for us to achieve our economical economies of scale, but at the same time, we are still providing a very solid return of investments. So, as I mentioned in the very beginning, our goal is to provide a smooth, seamless transition for advisors looking to exit the industry while providing a great service to the clients who are will, will, wishing to re remain in the book. So, we're a smooth, flowing manner of operations without break between advisors, and that is why we're called Legato. Any questions? So, yes, sir. it looks like your strategy is basically acquiring these small, got, so who on your team has uh, due diligence experience? Yes. So we are planning on outsourcing some of the, due, uh, some of the compliance related experience, but like my personal experience is I'm a CPA as well as um, I'm a pro project manager. <coughs> so a lot of these <coughs> fall into my probably purview in terms of expertise. Yes, sir. So I'm in the, I've been a registered investment advisor for 20 years. Okay. All right, so I have a oh. couple of questions for you. Um, who's going to be your broker dealer? Yeah, well, we're going to probably have like Fidelity or like a, I mean, well, we, I mean we have to identify. So, a so the, book the thing is, broker. When, you know, because my firm we buy practices in, in, in healthcare, but other, but not so much in uh, investments because when you're dealing with broker dealers, right? You, um, if it, one, if you're at the insurance broker dealers, the New York Life's, the Mass Mutual mm -hmm. stuff, they're controlling those books, right? Yep. And, and and then if you go to UBS or you go on the, so the, really the only market to really go get books easily is the independent RIAs, right? Yep. And who then are mostly are fee-based anyway. So the costs, most of them are doing fee-based now. Well, because, okay. yeah, be, I mean, the independent RIAs, who are the easiest ones to purchase, <coughs> they're, 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 they're in the sweet spot for you, right? As far as wanting to get out of the business. Yep. That's funny, I was just telling him earlier, the demographic problems that yep. the insurance and investment uh, have as far as age of people. So I'm just concerned for you in that I, there's not a savings, it's just a matter of people wanting to get out because the independent RIAs are the easiest ones to go after. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I've advised CPAs that want to get into wealth management, what they what they do. So the independent RIAs are the ones to go after. There's not so much a savings, and they're going to be the cleanest books for you to go after because they're not generally going to have a lot of annuities and other yep, stuff in exactly. there that make it a little more difficult because the other broker dealers have been pushing annuities and all that other product, and the books kind of get it's contaminated, for lack Absolutely. of a better word. Right? Yeah, and then when they push those products in there, it also creates higher fees because it's most likely commission-based. Yeah, board. don't ever use the word kickback either okay. because there's no yeah. one I know that's <laughs> properly licensed as taking kickbacks. Well, okay. No, I'm just telling you because yeah, you're going to turn off an audience. And just, mm -hmm. Thank, yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you for that feedback. So, so, what's the average assets per investor in your model? The, the average assets per investor. The per per yeah. uh, customer client to the to the independent advisor. What's the average yeah, assets definitely. in your model? Yeah, well, it, it, it difference between. Well, if you're in that small marketplace, it's yeah. going to be under a hundred, yeah. right? Because you Cause they're not said, they're not at the lowest fee schedule to begin with. Yeah. Well, it's. You said it's cheaper to acquire customers by. 
by do, buying books Correct. than it is going out and getting them. And you stated that it was like two to three hundred thousand, uh, two 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 hundred three hundred dollars. Correct. Versus two hundred a thousand. But yep. that would have to presume then that it's what is. Have you assumed an average asset yeah. per client in we, that in that fifty million dollar average book that you're buying? So I think we're going to be acquiring what close to like a ten million dollar book costs yeah. about uh, ten thousand dollars initially. So you're looking at about two hundred fifty dollars, and that's how we're getting our two to three hundred dollars per client acquisition. Whereas if you look at a lot of the industry standards, the cost of buying a new client or acquiring a client from scratch is it's going to cost about three hundred to a thousand dollars. But again, this three hundred dollars also includes a lot of robo advisors. So if you're offering a personal one-on-one -on -one service, you're looking at closer to the eight hundred dollar range. So that's why we're we're more we're attracting this underserved market essentially. And so you, did you just say that the average price for the 10 mil, it'll be a $10 million book and Roughly. you'll pay $10,000 for it? Yes, that would be like the, the And so the, the seller's going to get all excited about that? The yeah. seller of the book? Yes. Well, I mean, he's, he's only making 1%. Yeah, he's only yeah. making 1%. At yeah, best. Well, and, that's, I, and that's before his fees. And that's, I, mean, I mean, it's before his record keeping fees and everything. Because typically, right, if you go to your wealth managers, they're charging you between one and one and a half percent, depending on the size of the account. Some might go as low as 75 basis points. So mm -hmm. one percent is $100,000. Uh, uh, of 10 million, yeah. Well, well it's $10,000 exactly. to one million, yeah. Yeah, and then going forward, it's one percent. But Yeah, but his profit on that might be 50,000. So I don't know if he takes just 10,000. Is he taking just 10,000? for? Well, I mean, he million? might ask for a premium depending on how much he's making. But he's also, the lower, the smaller the books, they're having more than, a higher than one percent. They have... Yeah. I mean, just looking at our data. Well, the smaller these, books are getting, like a smaller account, they're making one and a half points, Yeah, right? two, well, two, well, according to our data, two to three percent. Yeah, it depends. depends. I mean, because, because of fee disclosure and stuff, yeah. and yeah. then you also got to factor in how much is in retirement accounts, and so how much could you have problems if the DOL rule comes through? Now, that could be incentive for guys to get rid of the book because the DOL that, that's actually what that's why we're seeing response. a lot yeah. of supply in the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um... So that, yeah. What, so, so did you mean before to say a hundred thousand dollars? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so, with that, do you have any information on the stickiness of, of the book, <coughs> the clients behind the book, after the registered advisor disappears? We, retention ratio. We do have some retention ratio assumptions. Yeah. So even if. We, we, we did several calculations. We did a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. Even if we have 85% retention ratio, we can, we have 85% retention ratio, we can break even on that book specifically, that single book, within three years. Now, if it's a worst case scenario where half the, like the, there's culture shock or the, the, the book blows up or whatever, and there's a 50% retention ratio, then obviously that rate of return is going to be dragged out where you get that initial investment over like seven years. So the point is, as uh, Sophia has been indicating, working with that inv investment advisor onboarding that client with those clients with us so we can have that higher retention ratio and then that's where that data analytics comes in as well for every additional book that we we purchase we're gonna have more and more data on the clients and then hopefully to the point where we can just say hey we don't want that book because it doesn't have the specific checklist that we want and then we can more systematically purchase also the, structure. also the, the price of the books is tied to the retention to the retention ratio to the overall retention what percent ratio. of the deal is, is earn out yeah, so if, if well, what percent is there in it? let's say let's use a million dollar book, $10,000 <coughs> just for easy math, 1%. If the retention ratio, retention ratio is 85%, we don't have to pay for the 15% that leaves. It's the earn out is that we're going to pay that. Are you paying 100% of the consideration on earn out? No, we only pay the percent that stays. I don't think you understand the question. Okay. If, if there's an acquisition price for the book, what percent of that acquisition price is structured as earn out? How much is paid up front? And then how much mm -hmm. you out of the ten thousand. Yeah. So no, no, no. yeah, but that's gonna you give him eighty, and then he has an earn out of two. Yeah, so it's it's gonna be on a. 80. We're not gonna like give him the, all the money up front. We're, we're gonna earn it out on a continuous basis, quarterly and through does time. Does he get it front? Anything? Yeah, well, he, yeah, he would get like twenty five percent of it until we get out of it, until he, he gets his complete money due, um, and then we have the retention ratio what it should be because we people are not gonna just leave all at once. I mean, if they leave, it'll be as they're going through time. But if so they how stay, long is that earn out, though? Is well, we're doing it, we're doing, yeah, we're doing a year earn out, yes. One year earn out? Yes. So get 50% up front and 50% at the end? Well, we're going to look for 25% in the front going every quarter. Yeah. <laughs> who else is out buying these? If, if it's the independent RIAs, who else is but out it, buying you these? You know, it's, not, it's more, you know, there's more acquisitions like in the health insurance books or the life insurance books. 
than there are on the investment side because it's it's a trickier thing dealing with BDs and, and, and broker dealers and everything. Um, you know, so and, and, and the factor is really getting about. So the larger ones, like people that have the larger, which they're the market they're not going after. Oh yeah. It's actually it's a more it's a more expensive, but it's easier because the accounts are bigger. And so if you have them sticking around, you know, you got accounts that are all, you know, you know, some of the higher end RAs, RAs have million dollar thresholds, right, to, before they take you on. So, so yeah, we're targeting these yeah. very small clients because there isn't really, uh, there, of course, there are people who are looking to acquire their books, but we're specifically targeting them because they're, they're probably within our costs, honestly, that we can acquire them easily. But also, we're willing to do the work. A lot of I the big, oh, okay. I mean, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Awesome. Thank you for your questions, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>